we have been bombarded after last week and maybe even before last week with the concept of the very next season, which is to come, or the very next holiday, which all of us are excited about. In fact, if you are like me, you think that toward the end of the year, the holidays get better and better and better, or as some would say, gooder and gooder. We go from Halloween, which some people say is a devil's holiday, but I've told you before, it's just about free candy, fellowship with your children and fun. That's what it is. That's how we look at it as Christians, okay? So you got Halloween, and then you jump right into Thanksgiving, which, you know, we get a long week off, and we get to eat, you know, and sin a little bit because we eat way too much. And then we get to go shopping the next day and spend all your money and <laughs> on stuff you don't really need. And then in preparation for Christmas, preparation for the gift-giving season. What's interesting is, like many of you, I have children, and this is the time of year in which they get excited. Why? Because they are going to receive gifts. When we talk about gifts specifically, not just for Christmas, but just gifts in general, there are certain gifts that you will give to individuals throughout, especially your kids or family members, either due to the season or just simply because you love them. For instance, Seth, my oldest son, is going through driver's ed. And he will be driving pretty soon. And Seth has shared with me that he really wants a car upon receiving his driver's license. And as his dad, I want to get him a car. As a pastor, well, it might be a little bit of a struggle to get that car. My son and I, he has sent me, not a week goes by, he doesn't send me an image of a car that he wants to test drive or potentially get. In fact, he's even told me that, hey, Dad, I'll even work some over the course of the summer so I can help get the car that I want. So we have made an agreement, uh -huh. or I've made an agreement with him. Son, if you get a scholarship, full ride. full ride, that's right, you're going to be full ride, all the money to school, then I will help you get a more expensive car. He says, Dad, can we really afford that? You get the scholarship, Daddy will figure it out. Christmas is right around the corner. Kayla has asked for gifts such as a new earbuds. She wants the new iPad. No, no, not like a new iPad. In fact, when we told the kids we would not be spending as much money this year, Kayla is the only child who still put together a list that was as long as everybody else's combined, and then told us, well, listen, it's not as bad as it would have been. I only asked for eight things, okay? Elsie and Sierra, they're the good children. They take after their daddy. <laughs> they're just happy to be alive and to know that we love them. That's it. What's interesting about gifts, when we give them, oftentimes, the gifts in which we are given come with conditions that are often attached. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We ask that you will use this time as a way to encourage your people, strengthen our hearts, draw us closer to you. I pray and ask that you remove me and all of the things that may take place in the mind of a preacher in preparation for not only delivering your word, but then also standing up to communicate it. Yeah. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would take over, Amen. that it would be God's truth, God's word, not my own. I pray and ask, O oh God in heaven, that all of us in the house tonight be significantly encouraged, enriched, and edified. And you and you alone, our great God in heaven, you would be glorified. I ask and pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our Savior. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. We've been dealing with a sermon series from creation to redemption, and we have dealt with several things. And today we want to talk about a concept called perseverance of the saints. When we talk about our redemption and understanding it appropriately, we need to highlight the importance of right thinking. Because if we think right about our great salvation, our redemption, if we are thinking appropriately about 
what it really means and what has really taken place, then it will cause us to have a more appropriate response to God. It would be foolish for you and I to assume that unsaved people are not intelligent, are individuals who are at the bottom of the barrel, or at times are just simply wicked. When the Bible talks about wickedness or evil specifically, one of the things in which evil is often categorized as being evil is unbelief. And unbelief, regardless to who you are, hits all of us or can hit any of us, regardless how much money we make, how much money we don't make, regardless of the education that we may have or the lack of education that we may not have. It does not matter if you are rich or poor, black or white, American or non. It does not matter what time period you live in. At the end of the day, the concept or the idea of unbelief can impact any and some of all of us. And so when we think about unbelief and we connect it to evil, and then we hear the message of the gospel, it is often understood in our society this, that when you and I are going to get something, then oftentimes there are conditions attached to what we are getting. No one or many of us do not really believe that someone is going to do something for you without expecting something in return. In fact, we make statements like pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. We acknowledge that even if someone does do something for you, like help to give you a helping hand to lift you up, it is now your responsibility to now create greater opportunity for yourself because someone has given you a hand up. In essence, in this life, you and I often live life with the understanding or expectation that we must do something in order to get something, or if given something, we therefore now must do something in addition to that to hold on to, to maintain or make better what has been given to us. This type of attitude causes us to be self-sufficient and at times even walk in a mindset of independency. But this also at times causes us to think inappropriately about the great salvation that our God has given us. So part of the process in you and I understanding this concept from creation to redemption, part of the process in you and I not only understanding it but appreciating it and just simply going through it is to have the right thinking about the salvation that has been given to us as a gift from God. So where have we been? We have been here thus far dealing with the word justification that you have seen each week. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we read these particular words. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have highlighted this each and every week because justification is a huge part of our sanctification. And I've described for you or explained to you that justification can be defined this way. It is a legal act whereby God declares the sinner righteous by means of grace through faith. God is the one declaring the sinner righteous. And if God is the one declaring the sinner righteous, then that means that you and I are not responsible for our own righteousness. God is. This also means that if he's responsible for our righteousness, then he's also responsible for the peace that we have with him. And it is not you and I. Justification, a legal act whereby God declares the sinner righteous by means of grace through faith. In order to better understand salvation, Paul says this in Romans chapter 4. He makes these statements. Romans chapter 4, verse 2, for Abraham has been justified by works. He has something to boast about. Not to the one who, not to the one who works, his wages is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. In essence, here in Romans chapter 4, verses 2 and 4, Paul is just simply communicating this, that oftentimes when you and I do a work, it will result in wages earned. For instance, if I go to my job and I complete a particular task, if I complete my task 
and I do what has been asked of me, then my completion of those tasks warrants that you compensate me with cash. You give me a paycheck. Let me give you an example. If your boss came to you one day as you were sitting in your cubicle or came to you at your workstation and said, hey, I have a special gift for you. And you got all excited about the special gift that the boss said they had for you. And all of a sudden, as you're sitting there smiling, the boss pulls out your paycheck and gives it to you. And then follows that up with the response, you know, I'm really a good guy. In fact, this proves that I'm a good guy. You would probably respond with, I'm not sure why you are saying you had a gift for me, number one, because this is not a gift. This is a result of the work in which I have done. You are simply compensating me for the completion of the task in which you have asked of me. But the boss says, no, 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 I'm really a good, job, good guy, and I'm also very generous because I am giving you this paycheck. You and I would look at this boss as if they were a fool, and some of you would be looking for another job because you know your boss was crazy. In essence, if you go to work, when you get compensated for that work, that is not a gift that has been given to you. That is wages that has been earned by you. Paul will go on to say in verse 5 here, Romans chapter 4, these words, he will say, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Paul's point here is that when you understand what God has done in justification, you recognize this, that God's work produces a faith or causes or result, or I should say, as my justification or my salvation is as a result of God's work that I now believe in without any of my works. In essence, it is my confidence in his work of righteousness that will cover all of my unrighteousness. In a sense, what Paul is saying here, he is saying that God does not want you to keep working for your salvation or working to be right in his eyes. God just simply wants you to believe in the one who has done the righteous and uh, and great work who has died on the cross for your sin. I just want you to believe that. If you believe that, that will be enough for me to justify you. In essence, you and I haven't done anything except for believe, but to the one who does not work. Notice, you do not work, but believes in him who justifies. Justifies who? You, me, the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. Paul will say this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Some of you are familiar with it. It is this, it goes, it's read this way, for by grace you have been saved through faith. I like this last part. And that not of yourselves. Hey? You and I are saved by grace through faith. In essence, it is not something that you have accomplished on your own. It was not something you could even accomplish on your own. In fact, you and I were unable to accomplish for ourselves what God is trying to give to you and I. Why are we unable to accomplish it? Because we cannot live good enough. You cannot be perfect, and therefore God, recognizing your imperfection, has decided that I will make you perfect if you will simply believe in the perfect one. Now, what I like about this last part, it says, it's it's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. And a gift is not something that you have worked for, it is something that is just simply given to you, and while you may not fully understand the motivations behind why the person has gifted you this gift, it is a gift to you. So, we go back to that same illustration, that same image, and your boss comes to you and says, hey, I got a special surprise for you. 
Now, the first time he said this, he gave you a paycheck. At this point, you're not excited about what he's about to do or she's about to do next because you've already been here once before. And then the boss says, and, and when I give you this special surprise this time, I want you to go tell everybody how good I am. And you're like, yeah, right, okay, all right. And then he pulls out, she pulls out a check for $100,000. Now, at that moment, you know your paycheck is not that big, at least for most of us, yeah. all right? So when the boss gives you this $100,000, you're like, what is this for? Oh, just because I'm a generous guy who wants to share some of what I have with individuals who do not have it. In fact, not only did you get $100,000, but you get $100,000, and you get $100,000, and you be like Oprah Winfrey all over again, right? Yeah. At that moment, you are receiving a gift that you have not worked for. And while you are getting something because you are connected to an individual who not only has the ability to do it, but now the desire to do it, you will benefit in getting this gift because not only will you get your paycheck when that time comes, but now this is an additional thing that he or she is offering to you simply because they can. The question for you and I in that case is, will you accept the gift that is being given to you? And I would assume all of you, if your boss did this, would be accepting the gift. In fact, I would, all right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And what Paul is trying to communicate, what God is trying to make clear to you and I, is that the salvation, the redemption that you and I have, the, the concept of spending eternity with God when this life comes to an end, is not because of anything you have done. It is simply because of a gift that has been given to you. Right. This leads us to the question in which I want to deal with today and maybe even for the next couple of weeks. Good. And that is this concept of whether or not this gift that we have been given, mm-hmm. is it conditional? Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, and a couple of the following, 22, we read these words. And although you were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast. And it becomes... Scriptures like this and words that are written that you and I begin to ask certain questions about whether or not this salvation that is a gift that we have received by faith, or I should say through grace or by by grace through our faith, as we've received this gift, can we lose it because Colossians 1, 22 and 23 communicates here this idea, you have this if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast. It is words like these, scriptures like this, because this ain't the only scripture that will be written in this way that will cause you and I to question. But beyond just the Bible itself, life causes you and I to question whether or not what has been given to us freely as a gift is something that remains with us unconditionally. I know some of you are saying to yourselves, If you are my age or older, oh, Pastor, finally, thank you, because I've been wondering about this for the last 20, 30 years. I grew up in the church that said this, and I've been waiting to hear this topic. And that's probably only a few of us, because some of y'all are like, I could care less. You're just happy you saved. You ain't thinking about whether or not you can keep it or not. You're just happy you saved. I'm here to tell you that regardless of where you are at today, at some point in time or another, this will be a question, a thought you will wrestle with. Is it conditional? The words of Jesus. Jesus says this in John chapter 3. We're going to look at several chapters or several chapters in the book of John. The Gospel of John says this, chapter 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, I want to be very, very clear here. The word for uh, obey there, the concept in the Greek is a word that means to also believe or accept or to obey. So it is a word that has a few different meanings, and for whatever reason, this particular translator chose the word obey, but it's all in within the concept of believe, where you follow. Notice Jesus' words, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. 
Let me say it again. He who believes in the Son, Jesus is basically saying, if you believe in me, you have eternal life. Okay? But he who does not obey, believe, or follow the Son will not see life, but rather the wrath of God abides on him. Jesus is saying here, if you believe in me, eternal life will result. If you don't believe and follow me, the wrath of God that is already on you abides with you. Goes on to say here, next, next, next slide, next verse. Well, John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Jesus again making a statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. In John chapter 5, Jesus is making a similar statement, trying to help those who are following him understand that there is something to this faith that we have when we say we believe in Jesus that will warrant, that will bring about or result in this sense of eternal life with him, Mm -hmm. with God. We read on in the Gospel of John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40. These words, again, Jesus saying these things, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus says, when I came down from heaven, it wasn't about what my will was. It was about the will of the Father who sent me. So I am on assignment, on a mission, sent by my Father down here to earth to do a particular task. He goes on to say, the one who sent me, this is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given to me, I lose nothing. Okay? Okay? Notice here, of all that he has given to me, I lose nothing. But raise him up on the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him, okay? So everyone who sees him and believes in him will have what? Will have eternal life, okay? Okay? will have eternal life, and I myself, again, makes the same, will raise him up on the last day. Jesus is communicating here that, that, that belief is what not only accesses or grants you this gift, but it is that belief that also results in eternal life. One more. John chapter 10, verse 27, a couple of the following. My sheep hear my voice. I like this one, okay? Listen, y'all, whenever we're out and about and it's time for us to go, I just, Boyers! When I say that means everybody with the last name Boyer, it's time to go. And my kids will start to make their way to wherever I'm at. You know what's interesting? Sometimes I'm at a family event where everybody there is a Boyer. But when I say Boyers, my children know my voice. Jesus is saying here, when I speak, my sheep, even in the midst of other people's sheep, oh, they know my voice. And guess what? Oh, and they follow me. So if you're ever wondering whether or not someone belongs to the sheepfold of Jesus, just look at when he's talking and then how you follow, and then look to see if other people are following you as you follow Jesus. Because if they're not, then they may not be his sheep. All right? Now, I didn't say that they weren't. I don't know what they are. Jesus is clear. My sheep know my voice. They follow me. And guess what? I give eternal life to them. And they will never perish. I like this one. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. It's all my sheep right here. And when I speak, they listen. When I speak, they follow. Oh, and just if you think we're playing that game, you know, you put the quarter in somebody's hand and see if you can grab it up before they can close it. Ain't nobody snatching nothing that belongs to me out of my hand, all right? Okay? You cannot take from him what has been put in his hand. It all belongs to him. And I don't care how much you try, you're not snatching it out, okay? His reflexes is too fast. His grip is too strong. 
Oh my goodness, I should, I should start hooping now. I should start hollering and shit now. All right, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm teaching, okay? I'm teaching. You cannot snatch it out of my hand. It goes on to say, verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. I like this part because Jesus says, just, think, just in case you think you're faster, stronger, and better than me, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. He said, oh, you didn't realize that you thought you was just in my hand. No, you was in my hand, who's also in the Father's hand. Therefore, ain't nobody getting what has been put in here. Okay? Now, all this is centered around Jesus wanting his disciples to know that when you believed in me, when you accepted my gift, it resulted in your eternal life. Okay? Paul says it another way in Ephesians chapter 1. He makes this statement, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Now, if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, uh, verse 11, we'll kind of start this off. Actually, the whole first chapter pretty much communicates, talks about our, our, our salvation, like sin, God's choosing us, in verse 4, and then it comes down to verse 11, 12, and 13. And I'm picking it up in verse 13. It says, in him, meaning in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth. Okay. Now, this is where commas and stuff like that is very important in, in a sentence. It says, in him, in, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, and in case you're wondering what that message of truth is, the gospel of your salvation. So after you heard the gospel of salvation, after you heard the gospel, which is the truth, he says, you listen to it, but he goes on to say, having also believed. So you didn't just listen, you just didn't hear. You believed what you were listening to, what you were hearing. So you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Not like this. You were sealed. When he makes the comment, you were sealed, it is like when you go to the store and you pick up a, a jar of mayonnaise or a jar that is sealed, you recognize that as long as that seal remains there, then the product inside the bottle of the can will last longer. But the moment you break the seal, all of a sudden then what's in the jar will not last as long. The point here is that when you believed in the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, all of a sudden you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is important because when God seals you, when God puts a seal on you, only God can break the seal. But Jesus already told us that that seal won't be broken. And so he says, you are sealed. Verse 14, not only are you and I sealed, but the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption, or redemption, of God's own possession. And this should be to the praise of his own glory. When it says here, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. The Greek word here for pledge could also mean a down payment. Now, oftentimes I like to communicate this as layaway, but y'all don't know nothing about layaway today, so I told you my son wants a car. And what we will do here in the next six to eight months is we will go out and we will look for different cars. And if we see one that he really likes, but I have not yet seen all the ones that he has given me on his list, I will say to the person at the dealership, hey, what can I give you to hold this car until I come back. Something serving as like a down payment to say not only am I serious, but it will keep you from selling it to someone else. And whether they say that's $100 or 500 bucks, or if they just say simply your word, which I would like. They probably won't say that, but I would like that. What they are saying to me because of what I'm saying to them is this. I am saying to them, I am coming back. And I'm going to lay something down of monetary value that assures you that I'm going to come back. When God gives you and I the Holy Spirit, it serves as like a down payment for the inheritance when he comes back. Eternal life. Another way to describe this would be whenever people call you and ask you, do you own your house? 
I've always answered, no, I don't. Oh, so you're renting? No, I'm buying. But right now, the bank still owns a house. I am making payments for the rest of my life. How did I get here? But when we went to buy a house, they asked me for a down payment, which was like my first installment, that I was going to keep making further installments of payments until one day I had spent 30 years and now the house belongs to me. So call me back in 25 years and ask me that question, and yes, I will own the house. But what they are saying to me is, we recognize that because you put a down payment down, because you are making monthly payments, we are assuming or acknowledging that the house belongs to you, even though it's not in your name. That what you are paying for, you will one day own for yourself because of the installments and payments in which you are making. When God gives you and I the Holy Spirit, he has given you the first installing payment to assure that as you live this life, he will at times reaffirm through answered prayer, through life circumstances in which it all works out, through times when you are worshiping and you start crying because of the goodness of God just flowing all over you, to remind you of the salvation, the inheritance that is to come. Before I got married to a lovely woman, I gave her a first installment called an engagement ring. And this was a promise that if you act right, you'll get the wedding ring. <laughs> engagement ring is given with the promise of my intentions to make you my wife. The Holy Spirit is given as a way for God to say, the inheritance that belongs to you or that I'm giving you will be here for you, for it remains. Finally, one other passage I want you to see today. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And this is not only do we have a down payment in the Holy Spirit, but this is promise protection. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Okay. Through, through, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ yeah. from the dead, the gospel, yes. to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable undefiled, and will not fade away. I mean, that right there, like, think about those words. So the inheritance in which you and I are going to receive because Christ has obtained it, it is imperishable. It does not fade away. In fact, verse number five goes on to say, reserved in heaven. For you. So anybody who thinks that the only heaven you're going to get is here on earth, you are sadly mistaken. There's a greater heaven reserved for you when this life comes to an end. You know, reserved means that means you called ahead and made plans. No matter who else shows up, your reservation is still awaiting you and your arrival because you have already called ahead to make it. In essence, what God is saying or what Peter is saying here is that God has already reserved your spot in heaven. And because he reserved your spot in heaven, no matter what's happening here on earth, no matter who else will also be reserved in heaven, your spot has your name on it. And the good news is, unlike this world, people can act like they're you and take your reservation. Well, God knows when it's you. He says, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by what? By the power of God. Which means you're not protecting nothing. You don't have to hold on or maintain nothing. It is being protected by someone else, namely God, through faith for our salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. When we talk about this concept of perseverance, perseverance can be 
defined as this. I said this earlier and I forgot. Perseverance of the saints can be described and defined as this. All who are truly born again will be kept by God's power until the end of their lives. And only those who persevere have truly been born again. Now, if you've been tracking with me, then you recognize that I've given you pretty much the first half of this definition. All who truly are born again will be kept by God's power. You've seen that in John. You've seen that in Ephesians. You've seen that also in 1 Peter. God is the one keeping and sustaining your my salvation, not you and I. He not only has obtained it, he's maintaining it. But he goes on to say, in other lives, and only those who persevere have truly been born again. Okay? Now I'm going to come back to Colossians chapter 1. Guess what, y'all? I'm almost done. If you want the rest of this, you got to come back next week. Because there's more to this than just what I'm giving you this week. I just don't want to give it to all, to only it all to you at one time. Too much to digest. Okay? Give it to you in little pieces. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 says this again. It says, and although you were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. He's talking about your my former life. Although you and I were once this way engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Okay? He goes on to say in verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast. And so when we see this, if indeed you continue in the faith Firmly established and steadfast. And if we stop reading here, we miss some more things that go on in verse 23. As Paul will continue to write in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Now, there's more there, but I want to just focus on these words for the last few minutes. People ask the question, is my salvation conditional? Answers to the question based upon the scripture, of course it is conditional. But if we do not understand what the condition is, we will put its conditional terms in our own worldly terms and then miss the real conditional clause there. Notice what the condition is. The condition is simply, do you believe? The condition in which you and I are dealing with is a condition of faith. Faith is the only condition of your salvation. So then that leads us to this place of whether or not if faith is what gets it for me, is faith what loses it for me? People struggle with faith because they ask the question, how can I believe in a God that I cannot see? Not realizing that your everyday life is nothing but a big faith journey. You get in your cars hoping to make it to work. Guess what? That's faith. Why? Because you're not there yet. You and I will sit at our desk. Guess what? It takes faith to sit in that chair. Why? Because you believe it will hold you up. When you and I leave the house, when you and I get up in the morning, your whole day is simply just a faith walk. You don't have a problem believing in what you can't see. You have a problem believing in the God. Well, you can't see. Anyone who has ever gone to see a specialist knows that you are walking by faith. How do I know? Because you will go see a doctor with a last name you cannot pronounce. They will give you a prescription in which you cannot read. You will then take it to a pharmacist who will give you some medicine that you have no idea what it is. You just believe that because the doctor said it, wrote it, the pharmacist read it, and then took it off the shelf, that somehow it's going to make you better. And many would say, well, of course I believe in that. There's so much evidence I saw the piece of paper that said he graduated from this particular institution that validates that he knows what he's talking about. In fact, I've gone to a pharmacy and gotten medicine from a place that the FDA has recognized as a legitimate place to get the medicine in which I'm taking. Finally, the medicine itself has been tested over and over again, even though I was not there, 
which is why they put it on the shelf in the first place. In essence, my faith is based on the evidence of what I have seen, even though I have not yet experienced the healing from the medicine that was written on the paper prescribed by the doctor given to me by the pharmacist. Well, I'm here to tell you, we got lots of pieces of paper. If you're looking for a piece of paper, I got several hundred of them. That will be evidence of what God has done and that he exists. If you need FDA approval, meaning that they have tried and tested it well, there are lots of folks who have prayed. There are times where I have prayed or did what this book said, and it just simply worked out. And that's just what I'm saying to you is this. There's a lot of folk who have experienced the Lord walking by faith, and there is evidence all around you. The question is not... You're wrestling with what you cannot see, believing it. The question is whether or not you are wrestling and believing in the one that you cannot see. And when you and I begin to wrestle with God from the standpoint of, hey, I am not sure he is who he says he is or he is who you say he is. And yes, this will keep you from a great salvation. And over the next couple of weeks, week or so, I'm going to spend some more time diving into that. Because some of y'all real, who grew up like me, you kind of struggle a little bit. So let me be clear. Your salvation, if you have it, was obtained by God, it is maintained by God. Your inheritance into heaven was not a work that you did for you, and it's not a work that you can maintain for you. In fact, just as you didn't work to get it, even if your works are not that good after you get it, it still belongs to you. Why? Because you didn't get it, you don't have to maintain it. God did the getting of it, God is going to maintain it. See, part of the problem, again, goes back to what I said earlier. That is, Christmas is coming. You and I are into the gift-giving season when we will give gifts to those who we love. You and I recognize in this gift-giving season that we will give gifts with certain conditions. What I mean by that? Kayla may get the gift that she wants. And on Christmas morning, she will be excited to get the gifts that are given to her, whatever they may be, because you may not get all you want. But the reality of it is, is this, is after Christmas morning, if she starts acting up, we're going to withhold some of the use of the gifts that were given. All right? You start being inappropriate or you start smelling yourself or getting too big for your britches, and all of a sudden, whatever I have given you, I can take back from you. Seth wants a car. Part of the reason why I want to buy it is so that way I can control when he drives it. Amen. Because at times, our gifts are conditional. But it's not just in gift giving. Our gifts are conditional in business. You work, and as long as you do your job, you will get a paycheck. It is a conditional relationship. Your marriages at times, they are conditional. If you are good to me, I'll be good back to you. In essence, we live with a life of conditions. And so it is natural for us to assume that after we have gotten this gift from God, that we somehow have to do something to hold on to and maintain the gift. My children have a gift. I've shared with them this gift on a couple occasions. When I die, there's a life insurance policy in which each of them will be given a certain amount of money, a significant amount of money. Whenever we talk about this, my kids say, oh, okay, all right, and they go on and keep doing whatever it is they're doing. I'm talking about it now, and Seth is on his phone. Because this gift does not have an immediate return or enjoyment like a car, 
like a cell phone. Nevertheless, the day will come where my kids will begin to realize just how significant this gift is. And sometimes you have a tendency to think that because someone is going to leave you something, then you've got to do something in order to make them to feel like they should still give it to you. But if you know life insurance policies, you know they don't work that way. See, life insurance policy works this way. If I put your name on it, when I die, you get it. Does not matter how good you are. Does not matter uh, whether or not we ended or you were going down the right track. It does not matter if I even liked you before I died. The fact that your name is on the policy means that you will inherit whatever portion of the policy that you are to inherit. What's also true is even at the time that I pass away, they cannot find you. They will hold on to that particular policy and amount until they find you. In fact, they will come looking for you in order to make sure you get the inheritance that was set aside for you. What am I saying? If Seth comes to me, if Kayla comes to me, if LC comes to me and says, Dad, what do I have to do to stay in your good graces in order to make sure that when you're gone, I still get what you have set aside for me? The reality of it is, is it's been set aside because of your last name. Because you connect it to, you don't have to do anything to earn what I am working for to leave you when I'm gone. Your salvation, my salvation, is not something that you have worked for. It is not something that you have to do in order to maintain. Your name is already written on it because of your connection to Jesus by your faith in him. And so I don't care how bad you are. I don't care how slow you grow. I don't even care how, how good you start off and then fall away with regards to some of your works. I need you to understand that when the day comes when someone tells you you no longer have what God has given you, you remind yourself that your inheritance in heaven has been reserved with your name on it. And because it's reserved with your name on it, because you obtained it by faith, God holds on to it because of faith. So... You and I cannot lose what we did not work for. And when you understand just how good God has been, not only even today, but also for your future eternity, you will not only think about him more appropriately, but you will also begin to worship him more accordingly. This is the word of our God. Hear it, believe it, and receive it on today. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for who you are. Thank you for your word and your truth. But I pray and ask that you continue to work in the hearts and minds of your people to draw us closer to you. Not because we need to be close for the salvation you've given us. Because that's already sealed if you've given it to us. But closer that way, we may live and look like the salvation that we are inheriting. But I pray on today that my words will fade away. But your word will remain in the hearts and the minds of your people. And that we will walk with a boldness, a confidence, an assurance, and the gift that you have given to us. And we're very careful to give you and you alone all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, The Bible, even in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, what Paul is trying to communicate is don't shift from faith. Don't lose sight of the gospel that can save you. In essence, God is offering you a gift, a gift of salvation. And it's possible to understand the words and even the meaning behind the gift, but still walk away from accepting and receiving the gift. 
when you and I hear the word, when we at times even know the gospel, we may even believe that the gospel could be true. We don't accept it. Then you don't have it. If I stand here with $100 to give to a person, they can see it. They can believe that I'm really willing to let it go. But if you don't take it, then you miss out on the gift. The gift that God has given to all of you, to all of us, that he's offering to you and I, is eternity with God after this life. He said, but if you want this gift, part of accepting it, part of receiving it, is simply by believing it. By believing it. Nothing else, nothing more. The question is, will you believe? Will you accept? This morning, if you'd like to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, hearing today's message is causing you to reflect and to ponder on not only who you are today, but where you ultimately want to be tomorrow, where you want to spend eternity. And the Bible is very clear. If you want to know that if you die today, you'd be going to heaven to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. And all that simply means is you saying, I believe the message of the gospel, that I'm a sinner. Too bad to be in God's presence. But because of God's overwhelming love for me, he sent his son to die for me, that I could be with him for eternity. Today you want to make that confession. We simply ask you today to bow your heads and pray this prayer. You want to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Repeat these words after me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner. Preacher said, the Bible says, if I believe in Jesus as Lord, then he will save my life. Not just for today, but for all of eternity. So today, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. He arose from the grave. And one day is coming back again. I make him not just Lord, but Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who are here today who are looking to recommit your life, Maybe because you've been wrestling with this concept of wrestling with something else, but you have found yourself at times, at times realizing that worshiping God is inconvenient. Did y'all hear me? Sometimes worshiping God is inconvenient. He interrupts your life. Some of you didn't want to get up this morning. Because it was raining. It was cold. You stayed up too late last night watching football. And to get up this morning, it would inconvenience your sleep. It would inconvenience what you want to do. And oftentimes, we don't come to church. Oftentimes, we don't pick up our Bible. We don't pay our tithes. Because it's inconveniencing our life. Kingdom life, I want you to understand something. God is worth the inconvenience. He is always worth the inconvenience. You will be sick and go to work for a paycheck, but you won't come to church to honor the one who has saved your soul, to say thank you, to be a part of a body, to offer up gifts, to serve, because it's inconvenient. (laughs) So many things inconvenience your life. And I'm here to tell you, you and I inconvenience God's life. Yet you were worth every inconvenience that it took to not only create you, to give a law, but then to send his son. God is and always will be worth any inconvenience in your life. Today, if you want to recommit in some capacity to Lord Jesus Christ, I want to simply pray for you. 
I'm not going to ask you to repeat words after me. I'm simply just going to pray. I said, every head be bowed, every eye be closed. God in heaven, renew our hearts. Renew our minds. Continue to renew our minds. That we begin to think differently about you. But when we say think differently, think with greater accuracy of not only who you are, what you have done, how much we mean to you, and just how good, how good you are. In this life, we'll have trouble. In this life, we may experience persecution. In this life, we will fall down. But Lord, in this life, we always have the hope of you, our great God. We thank you as we not only make commitments, but even renew commitments to love you, to live for you, to serve you, oh God, to even be inconvenienced by you. Because serving you and doing the work that you called us to do, there is no real inconvenience. In fact, we pray that it becomes very conveniently or our inconvenience becomes very convenient because we're worshiping you. Thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. All God's people said, amen. 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 Listen, I was like sitting over, well, we're all sitting, right? But I was over there, and I'm like, God, there's, there's just so much that I could say and write. But the one phrase that stuck out was belief gives us access. We pay for a lot of subscriptions. I know we do. Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, what else? What's the other one? Uh, YouTube Now. All of those payments give us access to that we, which we could not have access to unless we're willing to pay the cost. But what's really interesting is salvation, our belief, gives us access because Christ already made the payment. So I don't have to make extra payments. The things you can't watch on Hulu, you got to subscribe to Peacock because it's only on Peacock. You subscribe to Peacock. Well, the things that are on Peacock may not be on Amazon Prime Video, so then you got to subscribe. But to know there is just one payment, and it's not even the payment that we have to make that gives us access to this good God, this good Father. I pray you didn't miss this message on today. I pray you did not miss the fact that the condition is simply your belief, your faith. That's it. You don't have to subscribe to all three just to be able to watch your shows or games or movies. But you get access because of Christ's payment. Today's message was just phenomenal. If you are one today who prayed one of those prayers, if you recommitted, if you are one who just accepted the access through belief, we don't want you to leave here today thinking that you have access now and that's all, that's all I get. No, there's so much more in the waiting, as you're waiting for God to show you what it is you're supposed to be doing. We want to walk alongside you. We believe in discipleship here. If you are one that is needing to be discipled, and I like just dropped in me, don't leave this place. If you don't know your next steps, discipleship is for you because that will walk you through God's word so that way you can get to know him. And as you get to know him, you'll truly know what he has for you and what he wants you to do. Awesome Amen. sermon today. Just, I, I didn't fall. I love series. I didn't oh, fall. You see me, on, I was seriously. taking my hold, time. Hold on. Come on, brother. I got you. Listen, you, Baby, hey, you was preaching. Stop that. No, I was Yo. helping me. I was helping you out. You were helping me out. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, because you was and it was running. Okay, and thank you. know you. how I feel about sweat. <laughs> Yeah, we want to thank you for joining us on today. Before you get out of here, we want to get the opportunity to give. Uh, we recognize here at Kingdom Life Church, we often want you to see your tithes, your offering in a way that we believe is very biblically accurate, and that is you are not giving God 10% of your money. Amen. You're keeping 90% of his. Listen, there are several ways that you can give here as you give your tithes. When we talk about not really giving God 10% of our money, what we simply mean is that God is the source of all of your resources. Every dime in your wallet, every dollar in your pocket has been put there by the good hands of a good God who owns it all. He has decided to share some of his resources with you. He is the source. So what God has asked us to do is to trust him with 10% of that. 
at times to even give a little bit more than that in our tithes and our offering. As we're also being taught and trained to trust him with what he has entrusted to us. When you give a tithe, you're not giving God 10% of anything. When you give an offering, you are actually saying to God, I not only trust you for the minimum of what you require, what you ask for, God, I recognize that it all belongs and I want to give you a little bit more. And so as you give, we ask that you would give faithfully, give abundantly, give graciously, give obediently, but give hilariously. As you give sacrificially, as you just simply give abundantly. Several ways to give. You can give through our cash app. You can give online. You can also give through our Bible app. For those of you who are here in the sanctuary present today, on the, in, the, in the rear of the sanctuary, there are two black boxes. You can put your offering as you fill them out in the envelope in the one of those black boxes on your way out. For those of you who are watching online and you are not going to give online, please continue to mail in your tithes, your offering, your checks, because those things get here too. And we thank you in advance for all of the good gifts that have been given to our church to advance God's kingdom through the work that we believe God has called us to. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? We want to go ahead and get ready to dismiss you, get you out of here. That was a whole lot. That's all right. Did you get it? Do y'all know? I, I, I told you a few weeks ago that um, I ain't been able to work out because of the surgery that I had. Mm -hmm. Listen, y'all, I, I carried a box. Them COVID tests, mm -hmm. that, that I carried one of the boxes over here with Brother Vince. And the whole way over here, I was talking as I was carrying it. Then we got over here, and as he kept asking me questions and we were talking, y'all, I was so out of breath. <laughs> I don't know if he knew, but I was sitting there like, man, I... Y'all pray for me because I can't wait to run again, all right, because I'm tired of doing normal stuff that I normally do, and I can't breathe. Sometimes I'll be up here preaching, and I'm like, I am losing it. They don't even know it. I need a break. So let me pray for y'all because I'm tired. All right. Praise God. <laughs> Your track is coming. You're right. Oh, my healing completely is coming, all right? Y'all, we want to thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. We know you could have been any place else. For those who joining us online, thank you for being here. We'll see you back here again next week. We hope and we pray that not only will you experience God's blessing through this service, but you will fill it all week long. Let us pray for you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for who you are. Thank you for the goodness, the goodness in which you demonstrate not only in the blessings to us, but the great gift of salvation that you have granted to us. We thank you that we cannot obtain it on our own. We obtain it by faith because you have given it through your grace. Not of our own works. Therefore, we cannot boast. It's a gift that comes from you, our great God. As we leave this place, never your presence, help us to go in the peace and the understanding of a salvation, of an inheritance that is ours because you say so. And now may the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord our God make his face to shine upon you and also be gracious unto you. May the Lord our God, who still sits high, but is still concerned about things that happen down here below, may he lift up his countenance upon you, and may he give you his peace. We ask, pray, believe, and declare all these things. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord our God and our Savior, all God's people said amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to Kingdom Life Church's YouTube channel. Yes, thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. We hope to see you here in person sometime soon. God bless.